Hi, I'm Lucas, and today we're going to talk about the Blackmagic Cinema Camera. After I bought the Blackmagic Cinema Camera some weeks ago, some people were asking me if I could do a review on this one. And actually, at first, I didn't really want to do a review because um, I think there are so many great reviews out there already, so I don't know why people would benefit from mine. But uh, as I'm a generous guy, uh, I give you my take on this camera. So, but in this video, we only want to talk about the Blackmagic Cinema Camera as an object, how to uh, work with it and what we can do with it. Uh, and we don't want to look at the footage. So if this were both in one video, it would get really long and I guess really boring. So uh, I want to split this. And so let's start with just looking at the camera. So I guess many people already saw the Blackmagic Cinema Camera. It's not very exciting in the looks. It actually doesn't look too nice in my personal opinion. It does not a beauty in this uh, in these terms. Uh, we have not many buttons. We don't have many uh, things to, to know about this camera, actually. So on the left side of the camera, we have some connectors. So let's take a look at them. Uh, on the bottom, there is the uh, power connector. This is for external batteries, just as well as the charger. Above that, we have um, the Thunderbolt connector. The Thunderbolt connector is not able of copying files from the camera to your computer, and it's not there for recording directly onto your hard drive. It's only there to use um, the the, uh, the software Ultrascopes, which is provided with this camera for free. Uh, with that, you have some really great uh, scopes, all that you can imagine on your laptop right away. So next we have the HDSDI output. This is for monitoring the video signal. Uh, it outputs in 10-bit uh, 422 signal. Um, we don't have HDMI for uh, for monitoring, uh, but in another review, if you have an HDMI monitor and interested in another review, I will show you how to adapt the HDSDI to HDMI. So the next one is a bit bigger. These are the two mono 6.3mm uh, uh, TRS connectors for sound. On top of that, a 3.5mm TRS uh, headphone jack. Very simple. And just on top, we have a remote port. This is for a LAN control. I couldn't test it so far because I don't own a LAN control, but I guess it will work just fine. So let's take a look on the other side. This is a little bit less spectacular. We just have this door here. This is the door for the SSD because this camera records to SSD drives. We have this big port here and we have a little, just a little uh, USB port for supplying updates of the firmware for the camera. So let's have a look at the back. Uh, we have, as you can see, a very reflective touch screen, but uh, the controls of this is pretty cool. Um, then we have a few buttons, mainly for playback. Um, then also a menu button, a turn on and off button. The focus button is for the uh, peaking function. And of course, a record button. Uh, what I really love about these buttons is that these are covered in, in, uh, in rubber. And this is uh, straightly connected to the whole body. So uh, you don't have a gap between the buttons and uh, the body, so there cannot get nothing in there like dust or if you have sweaty fingers or whatever. This um, is really cool because it uh, feels really worthy in my hands. So this is the front. Um, very cool thing is we have a second record button. This is cool for several reasons to have a second record button. Just in the front here, the big red one. Down here we have a little microphone, which is only for reference sound, of course, uh, for syncing and post. And if you didn't have already seen this, this is the Micro Four Thirds version of this camera. Uh, there's an AF version, but I decided to buy the Micro Four Thirds version. So when you grab it and take it in your hands, you can really feel very fast that this is not a cam that you want to hold in your hands. It's ergonomically not perfect. We knew this before, but uh, with a little rig, this is perfectly fine. I don't mind this, uh, also because the quality is, of course, amazing. Um, one thing we also have is we have three one inch, one fourth inch UNC threads on the top of the camera and uh, one on the bottom. Now here's my uh, quick release plate uh, installed right now. And one thing we have to consider is we have a fan here. This actually here is a fan which is slightly covered by the plate. Um, many cases out there which you can buy for the Blackmagic Cinema camera don't uh, have holes for the fan and I really would recommend to uh, to accept that there is a fan and don't cover it. Um, the fan makes also some noises. I will just turn the camera on. So in real life, you wouldn't point your microphone directly onto the fan. And unless you do this, uh, the fan noise um, getting recorded isn't really a big problem in my opinion. 
Maybe you noticed we have these two holes in here. This is for uh, the sun hood that gets provided with the camera when you buy it. Very cool thing, you just get it on here and click it in. I think it, it, it's actually pretty really cool, it looks pretty nice, it doesn't help too much with the reflection of the screen, but however, uh, it's, it's really great for the looks. So I think by now we got a pretty good picture of what connectors we have and what mounting points we have on the camera, so now let's take a look uh, at the menus. So uh, now let's take a look at the camera and the menu and how to work with this. So the first thing first, um, before we get into the menus, we have uh, some things we can do with the touch screen right away. When we double tap it, then we zoom in. This is, uh, I guess, uh, one by one frame cut from the sensor. We cannot uh, adjust the position of this, but however, it helps us greatly to uh, focus better. And when we hit the focus button, you can see the uh, the peaking function I was talking about. So you can see this is the perfect and does not detect everything in the frame. In this frame, it's pretty good, but not every time. But I think this is a great little helper to get better focus. Also, when we are zoomed in with the double tapping feature, uh, so the peaking still works. So another great thing is when we touch the monitor one time only. So now we get in the project menu. So we can set a name for the project and we can set which reel, which scene shot take and which angle this is. We can do comments and keywords. This all gets written into the metadata of the shot. A really great thing about this is the little A button beside the uh, take number, for example, of the shot in the scene. So when you activate this, every time you hit the record button again, um, it will increase the number of this. This is especially interesting for takes, of course, so you always know which take you have. And this gets written all in the metadata, this is pretty neat. So now let's take a look in the normal menu. So in this menu we have four uh, rows of things we can set up. It's not very good visible for you now, due to reflection, however, um, this is what we can do. We can give the camera a name, this is pretty neat. I just click on the name, I called mine Betty. And now we can set a name for this. Uh, if you're not native English and you're a German or a French, um, you will notice that you don't have any letter that you might want to use. However, um, I think this is a downside, but however, it works still. So also we can set a date for the camera and uh, the time. This is pretty cool. So we always know, uh, this, this also gets into the file name. So we always know when this file was recorded without opening it. Then we have the ISO setting. This is here at 800 ASA. We also have 160, 200 and 400. So one thing to keep in mind is that 800 is the native ISO of the sensor. So when we decrease or increase it, we lose dynamic range. This works other from uh, Canon DSLRs, the sensor. So we will lose dynamic range when we change this value. When you record in RAW, this is totally obsolete because um, this is only written in the metadata. When you record in progress or DNX HD, this is important. 800 ASA will have the most latitude. Every other setting will have uh, decreased. Um, dynamic range. However, if you are in the darkness, of course, I would rather use 100, uh, 160 ASA so I see something instead of nothing, even if the dynamic range um, does not uh, increase or decreases a bit actually. And even when I'm in sunlight, I wouldn't use 200 or 400 ASA because you can simply use ND filters. Now let's take a look at the white balance settings. So um, this camera does not have many settings for this. We have 5000, 56, 665, 75, uh, 32 and 4500 kelvins. Uh, however, with the lock mode that is recorded, this is not a big problem. However, um, just so you know. So now let's take a look at the shutter angle. Um, angle for shutters is actually a relic from analog film cameras. I will link to a video that explains really great how this works and why this is. However, this is more or less the shutter speed you want to set. And um, this is uh, described in angles. And to be uh, to know how these angles work is you have to know the frames per second that you're recording. So for example, um, at a setting of 180 degrees at 24 frames per second, you get a shutter speed of uh, 184th of a second. And for example, when you use uh, 
uh, 24 pictures and recorded 360 degrees, you will get uh, a shutter speed of 1 24th of a second. Um, I will provide a little uh, Excel table I wrote so you can just uh, get your numbers in there and it will calculate for you which uh, angle is which shutter, shutter speed just so you know um, what to set here. So now this is this screen. Now let's take a look at the next screen, which is the microphone screen. So actually I, I'm not that much into audio and also I did not play with it much for now. So I cannot really tell you uh, anything but the obvious uh, microphone input. You have channel one and two input, the one as I showed you before, the speaker volume for the headphone jack and you can set it to line and mic. Um, yeah, that's pretty much it. So now we get into the interesting things. Now we have the recorder settings. Now we can set it to ProRes, DNX HD, or RAW 2.5K. Notice when you set it to RAW 2.5K, you cannot change the dynamic range from film to something different. This just won't work. This works only for the compressed uh, settings like ProRes or DNX HD. Then we can set it to video or film. However, when you record in video, you will uh, throw away much information. Um, it uh, might look good, but you throw much away much information. This is interesting when you want to record and don't grade much. This other thing, what you get from the film mode is uh, what people call a log mode. So then we have uh, the frame rates you can set. I use 25 frames per second usually, but we can also use uh, this weird setting for Americans, 30p, this weird setting, 24p, and that's it. Pretty easy. And then we have um, also the time-lapse interval. So we have off, of course, two frames a second, three frames a second, that's how it works. So then we can skip through it. We have uh, one frame every second, one frame every two seconds, and so on. And also we can set this to uh, one frame every minute, or two minutes, three minutes, four minutes, five minutes, six minutes, uh, and so on till it's off again. Notice for the time-lapse mode that um, this does not affect the uh, shutter angle or the motion blur. So the shutter angle will still be 180 degrees for 25p in this uh, reason. So it's always 1 50th of the second. So the slowest you could get for um, the shutter speed is 1 uh, 125th of a second for uh, this frame rate. This is a bit odd, but maybe they will improve it. However, for now, this does not work, so you don't get very nice uh, long streaks and motion blur, for example, when you make a time lapse in the night. So now the display settings, last panel. We have first the brightness settings, so we can set the bright brightness of the internal display. You can see a bit here in this recording. Then we have the dynamic range. We can set video or film. Then we have the zebras, which are very interesting. I show you this in a minute. And uh, last but not least, the SDI overlays, which are what's uh, provided for information for the SDI output. So the dynamic range option is pretty interesting, actually, because when you set this to video, you can see on this video uh, on the screen directly, we have pretty nice uh, contrast and pretty nice scene here. However, when I changed this to film, you can see it's a lot less nice to look at. This is the lock mode. And this would be the uh, Rec. 709 video mode. However, this uh, is pretty cool because this setting only affects the monitoring you have on the screen. So even though if you can record and film, we will record and film, however, we see the video thing, the video dynamic range. This is pretty nice because um, we get a nice saturated image to work with when we uh, set it up on set. So now let's talk a bit about the zebras. Um, the zebras have uh, some settings um, off 75, 80, 85, 90, 95 and 100%. So the zebras only show sensor clipping. This has nothing to do with the video or the film mode. It will also only show always the same values. So even if it clips in the um, video mode, it doesn't need uh, on the display, it doesn't mean that it clips in the footage. It clips when this indication shows that it clips. So when we record RAW, it's always uh, makes always sense to use 100% Zebra. 
So we see when the sensor clips, so we just turn away the zebras and we are golden and have the most dynamic range we can get from this camera. However, we don't have the massive latitude uh, in the compressed formats, so I like to set this to 95%. So we have a, bit, a little bit of a headroom. Now let me show you this. Uh, as you can see, now we can see everything, but even though uh, when I turn the aperture up, we can see we introduced the zebra. Now it's fully there, however, when you see here, it's totally blown out. We cannot see any detail anymore uh, in the many things, but still, all the information is still recorded. We just cannot see it, but we can bring it back and post. This is pretty interesting because um, uh, this is great because it's so easy to, to expose this camera. We just have to, uh, when we start with this, just have to dial the iris down or set ND filters or whatever till the zebra disappears and we have the most dynamic range we can get from this. So as you can see, this is the level where the zebras just disappear. I just will record this fraction. And in the second part of this video, we'll have a look at this footage so we can see right away what we can recover from this recording where we would say it's everything clipped away. So I think we're not done with the first part of this video. Uh, please stand by for the second part. If you don't have already, you could subscribe so you get noticed when it's released uh, sometime soon. So far, thanks for watching and uh, see you next time. Bye.